Well, Tom, welcome back to EdChat Interactive. It's great to be here, Mitch, coming at you from a some random hotel room in bitter cold Newark, New Jersey. If I open up my windows, you see a nice parking garage. So uh, thanks for those few issues there as I work with some air, um, some Wi-Fi here at the hotel. So we're, we are good to go, ready to share, and thanks for having me back. Okay, yeah, and uh, you know, Newark really isn't that far from, from where we are. If I had known you were in Newark, I could have come and picked you up. You could have been here. <laughs> And it's and by the way, bitter cold. It's it's only about forty degrees. I mean, bitter cold is um is is fifteen. Where are you from? I you know I should I should know this, but where where are you from? I'll do a quick intro. So hi everybody. If I haven't met you, I I live currently in Pennsylvania. I work out of Washington D.C. So um, born and raised in New York, but um, spent some time in in Pennsylvania. So just to give just very quick perspective, because this is not about me tonight by any means. Um, spent 14 years in a public school and as a, as a teacher, as an elementary principal, as a middle school principal. I also spent some time at district office and then as a tech director. I like to say I obviously couldn't hold a job, so now I work out of D.C. And so part of my role, I work with the Senate, the Congress, the White House, the Department of Ed um, in a bipartisan way. So, yes, I will continue to do so in the next few months and years and the, the work we're continuing to do. But then also is running Future Ready Schools, and that's what I'm excited to share. I actually spent all day running Future Ready New Jersey today here in Newark. We had about 50 district teams, all totally free events, and I'm excited to dive in, share with you today. Everything I'm going to be sharing today is totally free. There's no catch at all. So thanks for investing the time tonight. I know you're all exhausted. I'm sure you all had really long work days. I know that feeling. Being with 50 districts today and uh, excited to be with you all tonight. Share some tools, share some resources, share some content, but also I built in um, throughout the slide deck a number of questions as well. Get your thoughts, get your feedback. And so, you know, I'll share for a little bit, pose a question, have you guys kind of connect, share a little bit more content, so on and so forth, right up until about nine o'clock. So thanks for being here. And I'm Tom Murray. Glad to be your host tonight. You want me to just roll, Mitch? I'll just keep going. All right, next slide. Keep rolling through. Go ahead. Next slide. So, so to kick off, I do want to start with a thank you. You know, I, I get I have the, the the opportunity to present and share alongside uh, audiences around the country virtually every week, and and I will never, I, I promise myself, um, whether it's it's three thousand people last week or whether it's you know just a handful of people tonight, I will never start any sort of quick presentation, even conversation, without a true thank you. Thanks for the work you do every day. Thanks for loving kids. Thanks for being on an Ed Chat Interactive at 8, 8 o'clock at night while you're home, hopefully in your PJs, hopefully with a glass of wine or a beer. How often do we get to say that during PD, right? Um, but truly, thanks for all the work that you're doing every day. Go ahead, next. So I want you to write down two websites because I don't want you to get to 9 o'clock and, oh, shoot, what was the website? Two things here. One, first one, futureready.org. So the things that I want to be sharing are available. That's kind of our home site, our main site. The second is actually a resource we share at our Future Ready events. And it's, so it's bit.ly. And remember, bit.ly's are case sensitive. So jot down bit.ly, FRS, for Future Ready Schools, and then dash DW, which just stands for one of the dashboards workshops we ran what you're going to find on there is a lot of downloadables things you can share i get every day on twitter email those kinds of things what's something i can use with my district what's something i can send to my superintendent so we've got a lot of our downloadables there and you're welcome to use those and anything on those sites you're welcome to use and be able to share that stuff as well now don't go selling it because future ready is uh, trademarked by the alliance for excellent education but everything that's downloadable there and whatnot we encourage you to share next slide so keep going let's go ahead so welcome to the future let's talk about uh, um, i'm going to move through these kind of very quickly here mitch taking a look at you know we are seeing this disruptive innovation in every sector let's hit a couple of these just kind of big picture even step outside of education for literally two minutes you know look at these things remember these yellow things and, and i fly literally every week i took 120 flights last year in 2016. every week no matter where i fly in i, I remember only a couple of years ago standing on a street corner waiting for these yellow things to pull up and very rarely i think in the past year and a half i think i've taken one taxi that's it what has totally disrupted the space we look at the next slide there mitch taking a look at that what has totally disrupted this place you're already saying it, uber lyft those kinds of things as we look at things such as uber or lyft and which is just uber and lyft and we think about how it totally disrupted the space go ahead next slide mitch I told you I'm going quick. Look at the disruption in those areas. Look at just some of the, the numbers that you can see in just a, such a short time period. That's the first five years of Uber. Think of that as a growth rate for that industry. Next slide. As we look 
at that. Look at this. It's already being disrupted. And maybe some of you have seen this. Now, I reside in Pennsylvania. That's kind of where I live at least a couple days a week. I like the joke. But taking a look at that, that's already disrupting Uber. What is it? It is a self driving car that does the exact same thing yes they're testing it and you know that this isn't new we're, we're seeing this and that's outside of pittsburgh that's an article we saw so even the disruptor of only a few years ago is already disrupting itself and already changing so it's going to work in the same way we pull up the app we do all those things we click the button and now the car shows up now i like to joke and say you know i'm getting these things every week i'm not getting in a self-driving one not yet no way not yet not until they perfected that right go ahead the next slide as we think through the Uber, look at this industry. I'm, I'm, it's funny because I'm sitting in one of those buildings right now. That industry, as we started to get disrupted, next slide, was even a number of years ago when we started to think about all these. This is going back 15 years ago. First time you hopped on like Priceline or Expedia or any of those sites there, it gave you as the person that was actually taking a look, it gave you power. Because you could say, hey, I'm looking in Newark, New Jersey, and I pull it up, and there's 200 hotels right there with an ever X radius. Nobody cares what Marriott says about itself. Nobody cares anymore what the Hilton says about itself. Why? Because the power comes from what people are saying about it, what people are telling about the story. It gave you as the consumer choice. It gave you as the consumer the opportunity to say, look at all these different areas. Totally started to disrupt that space as years ago. Next slide. Now look at this, Airbnb. Anybody uh, curious to see who's been here in an Airbnb? Totally disrupting that space. Go to the next slide. We look at something like Airbnb. Here's just quickly how it started. Two roommates were out in San Francisco. They got together. There was actually a conference coming to town. And they said, you know, they're having a hard time paying the rent. They said, what if we allowed people to stay in our, our little condo here? And they brought in their airbed and we gave them breakfast for like 30 bucks. And actually, that's a screenshot that you're looking at from the first Airbnb. And it was airbed and breakfast. But guess what? It's totally done. Next slide. It's really started to disrupt the space again. If you think it's by chance that when you pull into a Marriott or a Hilton and they're like, oh, here's your free cookie. Go get your free soda. Here's our free breakfast. Well, no, they're meeting your demand better. Why? So you don't go stay at an Airbnb. So you still choose them. It's forcing them to innovate, it's forcing them to do it differently. Look at that growth rate. I don't think that Marriott and Hilton have taken notice of Airbnb. It's fascinating. In 2017, Airbnb is the largest hotel chain in the world, and it doesn't own any properties. The largest content provider in the world, Facebook, it doesn't provide any content. The largest taxi service in the world, it doesn't own any human-driven taxis. That's Uber. The, the largest movie cinema in the world, it doesn't own any cinemas. That's Netflix completely contrasting 10 or 15 years ago. It's fascinating when we think about that. Next slide. And we take a look at, and, and we look at this industry, just all these companies that you're looking at, 10 years ago didn't even exist, and within 10 years are worth over a billion dollars. Think about that. Some of us are looking like Pinterest and those kinds of things. Think how much time you spend on these kinds of Twitter, Facebook, all these types of things in, uh, on a daily basis. And for those, the ones you're looking at 10 years ago didn't even exist. Next slide. As we look at the, the moving forward, let's then talk about us. We can talk about all the other stuff outside of us as long as we want. But what about inside? What about us? What about when we look in the mirror? What about educational innovation? You see, having had the opportunity, I've had the opportunity truly to work with probably 700 district teams in the past year and a half. I've been to dozens and dozens, hundreds of schools probably in the past two years, thousands of school leaders. And here's what I can tell you. When we talk about innovation in education, we've got amazing innovation going on. I'll be the first one to tell you that. Having been from Atlanta to Seattle to California to New York, what's going on in our schools? In pockets. How do I know? You guys know how this is. I, when I get to do school visits, the principal meets me often at the door and they want to take me to two or three classrooms, the two or three classrooms that whoever comes to visit next, same two or three classrooms. How do we scale that up? How do we scale so the norm is innovation in our schools? What about us? Next slide, Mitch. Taking a look, and I like to show these, if you've heard me speak before, you've probably seen me even use this slide. When we take a look, and I'll use this at FETC, and I'll give a shout to FETC there too. One of the things I like to do occasionally is just, I, I encourage you to Google the like, classrooms of 100 years ago, 1917. See what kind of pictures pop up. And then Google classrooms when we're brand new to 2017, so 19 or 2016, and see what kind of classrooms pop up. Just by an image search, what's fascinating? They're almost identical. You've got 
teacher-centric environment, students facing forward, equidistant from each other. Next slide, Mitch. <clears throat> and taking a look, when we, when we push them together, we, we've really got this environment. Now, let me show you another study. We look at this. I'm not sure if you've seen this. This comes from the Gallup survey that came out this past year. The end number, I know the number is pretty small. It's about 928,000. So they surveyed over almost a million kids nationwide, coast to coast, urban, rural. They wanted to get the demographics, of course, across the U.S. And here's what it shows. The red line, and a shout out to my friend Scott McLeod, if you know Scott, who created this actual image, showed from our schools nationwide. In fifth grade, 75% of the kids identified as being engaged, self-identified. They said, we're pretty engaged in school, three out of four of our fifth graders nationwide. And it goes down in sixth grade, down in seventh grade, down in eighth grade, down in ninth grade, down in 11th grade, bottoms out at less than one in three of our 11th graders nationwide are saying they're engaged in school. Less than one in three. Then it ticks up senior year, which I attribute to like, oh shoot, I got to graduate or the like, like, I'm going to my prom, I love school. But put it this way, the longer we have them, the less engaged they become. My good friend, George Curls, one of the, the questions he often asks, and I love when he asks this question, is often like, if kids leave us, I guess more of a statement, but when kids leave us, if they leave us less curious than when they came to us, we fail. So next, next one, Mitch, <clears throat> take a look at this image and I'll just hit this one quick. The blue line in the last seven days, I've learned something fun in school. I'm sorry. In the last seven days, I've learned something interesting in school. Look at the green line. This hit, this one hits home as a dad, a little girl in, in a public school right now. Take a look at the green line. I have fun in school. Less than one in five, one in five of our high school kids nationwide are saying school's any fun. Look at the red line. At this school, I get to do what I do best every day. And when you take a look at that line, that red line that you see there too, it's starting to get to personalized learning, that personal piece. Because you all know in your schools, you've got the kid that shows up every day just because of chorus, just because of band, just because of football, just because of math, whatever it might be, their interests, their passions. So how do we leverage that? Next slide. So let's talk about future ready, because all that I showed you is that world of work, why we're trying to do what we're trying to do. Number one, like I shared, nothing I'm about to share costs anything. Number two, why? how is that possible? Number two, let me share just a, a quick piece to a quick history. So futureready.org, as you see there, is one of the very quick resources that I shared. That's going to be the hub or the home of where we release stuff, put stuff, stuff out there. So for the past two years, we've partnered with the U.S. Department of Education. Next slide. As you can see, there's been very supportive of the work. The president actually kicked it off himself. President Obama kicked it off two years ago. Um, but it's meant to be a very bipartisan thing, and you can see that moving forward. Created what's called the Future Ready District Pledge. So for those of you, whatever districts you're in, we've had about 3,000 district superintendents nationwide, 3,000 tenants do the same thing. 3,000 superintendents nationwide, they actually represent 19 million children nationwide, have signed the pledge that you're looking at. So one of the things I would encourage you to do is, is if you go to futureready.org slash pledge, send that to your superintendent. I'm not sure. I know some of you might be in massive districts and maybe you don't know him or her personally, but check that out. You can also check right there. Has your superintendent signed the pledge? You can actually check that out. That's, we put that out publicly on whether they've signed it or not, and they know that. But things like they're looking at, for instance, creating that culture of digital learning, transitioning families to high-speed connectivity, um, professional learning opportunities, then access for all students to quality devices, high-quality digital content. Family reach, families reach higher. That's that college and career readiness piece. And then the last piece is also helping them transition, that mentoring. How do we break down one of the biggest goals of future ready? How do we break down the traditional silos? We've got to get to the point in education where I care just about the, as much about the kids across the highway as, about, as I do about the kids that are sitting in front of me. Go ahead, Mitch. Next one. So when we take a look, let me just give you some perspective here. See, Future Ready is not just the Alliance for Excellent Education, you know, supported by the U.S. Department of Education. It is a coalition of your organizations. And I don't say that lightly. It's the organizations. So if you're a superintendent, AASA. If you're a principal, NASP, NASSP. If you're on the tech side, ISTE, COSIN, you can see just a snapshot, the National School Boards Association. From a teacher side, the AFT, Teach for America. They're all partners in this work, and they all support it in various ways. Next, next slide. But it's a huge coalition working to support it. As I briefly mentioned, the president himself, the, um, I know we're going through a transition here, quite a transition, we can all say, kicked it off at the White House. A hundred superintendents came to the White House to kick this off because we are focused on leadership. Why? Even though we have lots of teacher unions and those kinds of things, because we've got to get the leadership 
on board and modeling the way and creating cultures of innovation, empowering teachers for any of this to work. And so we're really focused on that leadership piece. The president kicked off back in 2014. That was kind of that initial phase one. Next slide, Mitch. You can see across the dis across the, the country, and you can actually see when you go in there how many uh, superintendents in your state have signed that pledge. Now, I'll be the first person to tell you, signing a pledge in and of itself for your district doesn't do anything. I'll be the first to say that. It, but it's a public way to take a stand to say, we believe in this stuff and we're moving in this direction. But sure, a district can sign the pledge and not change a darn thing. Well, then it was just a waste of that few seconds of time. And so it's just, it's taking a stand, a public way to be able to say, we believe in this is the direction that we're going. Next slide. So the Future Ready Framework is one of the things I really want you to get out of here. So I'm going to share a handful of pieces of the framework, but I'm also going to pose some questions so we can chat and we can talk. And, and some of these look in the different areas. So this is a research-based framework to support really a more personalized approach, especially to high-quality digital learning. This is all focused on. So today, when I, I shared a few minutes ago, I spent today with 50 school districts from primarily New Jersey, but district leadership teams, 50 superintendents, and so on and so forth. And just about an hour ago, somebody said, you know, Tom, my biggest surprise is I thought this was going to be so much about technology. It's really about teaching and learning. Teaching and learning is the focus of this work. When you see people talking about really getting to leading with technology, run the other way. Because we can chase technology all we want. Technology is an amazing accelerant. I love ed tech when it's used well. When ed tech is not used well, it's a total waste of money. And so the framework is going to help us be able to do it. So let's dive into this a little bit to, to, to see all the different ways that um, districts have, kind of really have to focus and have their support. And I apologize my voice is going a little bit here. I've been doing a lot of talking today. Next slide there, Mitch. So first one, we're going to hit curriculum instruction and assessment. I'm going to pose a question in just a moment. But this is the heart and soul of what we do. What is it? And I love asking districts. I get to work with leadership teams all over the country, even just dynamic teams, kind of more in a consulting end. One of the questions I love to ask and love to start with them is really that visioning end. What is it that we want teach classrooms to look like? What are we even building towards? What is it that we want to get to? What, when I walk into a classroom five years from now in my district, in the district, does it, what do I want it to look like? Next slide. So let's focus on that curriculum instruction and assessment side here. So I do want us to take a few minutes to do this. And, and just because of the clock, let's only take about, I'd love for you to pair up with one person and ask this question. You just spend a minute or two, quick, real quick introductions. What is it that we want teaching and learning to look like in our schools? Because if we can't start to identify where we're going three to five years from now, how in the world are we going to get there? We're, we're just going to spin our wheels. And so what is it? So you can pose the question that you see on the screen there, or you can look at it like this. If I were to walk into whatever classroom, regardless of whatever position I'm in, five years from now, this is, this is what I really would want to see teaching and learning look like. So looking at my clock here, it's I have 829 on the East Coast. Um, I encourage you, let's let's take four minutes because this is kind of one of the, the, the bigger questions. Two minutes apiece, pair up with somebody. We'll jump back in at 833 and, and uh, pair up with somebody if you would. Answer that question. What do you want teaching and learning to look like? But say a quick hello. Go ahead and pair up with somebody. See you in a few minutes. Okay, and if you don't have a webcam, again, uh, move your cursor over your avatar and open up the IM window and uh, start interacting with people in the IM window about what you'd like to uh, you'd like to see for teaching and learning in your schools in the next five years um, and then and answer some of their questions. So uh, I'll bring myself down and we may be asking for some volunteers also to share with the group.
So, so you know, I've, I I looked at the question. I was thinking about it, and I guess one of the things that I've been thinking is that I'd like to see the first few years of school where we uh, use in order to give kids a basic background and to um, get them psyched to become autodidactics, to become um, in charge of their own learning. And then from about fifth or sixth grade on, and certainly by, by eighth or ninth grade, to see them really put in charge with their learning, the teachers become really more counselors rather than teachers. That's, that, that would be my vision. Sure. Thanks for sharing that. Now, one of the things that's really interesting, I so um, uh, my good friend, if anybody knows Eric Scheninger, Eric and I are publishing a book for ASCD and kind of in our, our final editing stages. And uh, one of the kind of the cases that we make really in our intro is if we're really going to be preparing kids for their world of work, we've got to start to identify what is their world of work, the best we can predict, actually going to look like. And it's right. not the world of work that we all grew up with. When you look at automation, when you look at robots, and you look at the overtaking of those types of things, when you look at so, and, and having worked with the White House and the White House Economic Council a little, the, the White House Economic Council made a prediction uh, about a year ago that 83% of jobs that make under $20 an hour will eventually be phased out. Right. Because when you look at, if you can be replaced by a computer, you can be replaced by a robot that can do it better and cheaper over time, you probably will be. And so sometimes people will say, well, are you saying teachers will be replaced by computers and robot response would that be? Like if you could be replaced as a teacher by a computer and a robot, I say this tongue in cheek, like you probably should be. Because all the great teachers that I know, there's no way in the world they could be replaced by a computer or by a robot. And so why? Because they build relationships, they love kids, the empathy, the set, like all the things that teachers do or admin do, no robot's going to come in. No computer's going to come in because this isn't just about like I work my way through content. And so when we take, take a look at that, though, what are the types of jobs out there that we need to be preparing kids for? What are the jobs that are disappearing? When you look at things like your factories, just last year in China, the first unmanned factory actually got unleashed. They had 625 workers throughout the factory. And over a six-month period, they now have three the productivity of that factory is up twice when than when people actually work there. Those three people now actually just monitor the computers that monitor the robots. And robots never actually ask for time off. They don't ask for a coffee break. They don't ask for a raise. And they're going to get better and cheaper over time. And people just don't. And so when you look at that, like what are the industries and what are the jobs we're preparing to doubt? The flip side to that are what are the growth rates? Because this isn't all doom and gloom. Things like healthcare up double digits predicted for the next 15 years. Why? Because people are living longer and getting older. Well, what skills do people need to be in the healthcare field in that age? Another one, computer science, double digits, next uh, probably 15 years or so, projections. So computer type skills, definitely important. But how do we teach kids to be able to problem solve and critically think? And I like to be able to say, how do we teach kids and give them the skills so that they can create new industries? It's not that just these industries are going away. 15 years from now, there's going to be industries that exist that just don't exist yet. Those kids are sitting in our schools right now. How are we preparing them for that creation? Right. And, and you didn't even mention collaborate cross-culture. But I'll, I'll bring myself down, um, and I'll get your slides back up. Let's just, yeah, let's just, let me hit a couple things here, and then maybe we'll do one or two more discussion topics. I know a couple people chatted, which was good, but um, certainly don't want to force anything here as well. So jumping back over kind of the slides one of the things i want to point out and i'll go through these quickly very quickly there mitch noticing here these are what we call elements so each one of the gears and i'll go through these quickly have what are called elements these are the research-based areas so for instance this is curriculum instruction and assessment the first element there that 21st century of deeper learning um, that's that's a very research-based area and so these also we have a variety of tools and metrics that i'll kind of hit towards the end there that can be very much um, measured in your district all free tools next slide <clears throat> so where do we begin with this stuff? Go ahead, next slide again. And we got all of this stuff that's out there. You know, when I was a tech director in my last year, that picture right there, it's not a real picture from my office, but that's kind of what it would look like because we know the tech stuff's out there. We're really not getting these questions of like, I don't think there's any value to technology. Like occasionally once in a blue moon, you get it. But what districts are doing right now is essentially what we're seeing is they're buying all the stuff, Chromebooks, iPads, they're, they're all great devices, all how it's used. You're buying all this stuff, we're putting it out there, putting it in carts, putting it in hallways, putting it out there, and then really saying, like, now what do we do with it? Like, now that we've got 3,000 Chromebooks, how do we change our curriculum? Now that we have 1,000 iPads, how do we change our assessments? It's the way we're operating that. It's not going to make a difference. 
you know, when I was a, um, a, a tech director in my very last board meeting, I, I often tell a story. My school board president looked at me and said, you know, and by the way, this is not why it was my last board meeting. I was already going to D.C. It was the budget meeting. And he said, so, Tom, if we're going to spend this additional seven hundred thousand dollars in technology, will student achievement increase next year? It's actually a really good question coming from a board member. I didn't think so necessarily then. I thought maybe it's just are they trying to get under my, my skin? What is the case here? And, but when we're thinking about it, if I'm signing my name, any taxpayer money, and we're going to buy stuff, we better be able to say, like, this is what the stuff's impact is. This is what it's looking at. Next slide. What actually works? And let me hit this a little bit, because to answer the question that I was just posing, we have to know what actually works. And so my challenge for you, one of the things I'd ask you is, like when you're buying all this stuff and putting it in classrooms what actually is improving learning we get that question all the time that's a good question like what would you say you see here's the thing if i put my principal hat back on i could walk into a classroom i see 30 kids sitting on 30 devices 30 chromebooks ipad i don't care what the device is they could be learning incredible high levels or learning absolutely nothing Sometimes I'll see districts and principals and they got their little walkthrough checklist. They roll in and, yep, kids are on devices. This is great. This is awesome. That is no different than walking into a classroom and saying, yep, the lights are on. Yep, they're learning. Like it being on the device tells you nothing about learning. How the device is used is everything about learning. Why? Because you can have the exact same infrastructure, exact same content, exact same everything. And in one, one side of the, the hallway, it's used for very high levels. On the other side of the hallway, it's a waste of money. So what actually works? So what you're seeing there is a slide. You can see the URL. It's probably the longest shortened URL I've ever created. So we worked with Dr. Linda Darling Hammond. She's on our team at the, or I'm sorry, she's on our board at the Alliance, one of the top known researchers in the country. If you're on the curriculum side, you've done any research, you know Linda Darling Hammond is really, really well respected and well known. We spent about a year looking about every, 70 ed tech surveys her team did at Stanford on what actually works with ed tech. What works? We're going to spend the money. We've got to be able to answer what physically works and what are the practices that are a total waste of money. Here's what it boiled down to. Number one, is the learning interactive? So when learning is interactive, like we're seeing a lot of adaptive type of technologies, that's showing promise. That's showing worth the value. Um, the National Ed Tech Plan called that active use. Active use is I'm exploring, designing, like I'm, I'm creating that type of thing as opposed to consumption-based use. My three-year-old can use his iPad. He can hop on Netflix. He does a lot of consumption. He just does a lot of watching. He watches little TV shows. There's, there's not, it's not inherently wrong, but he's only going to get low-level learning out of that. It's consumption-based versus active. Um, the National Ed Tech Plan calls that the digital use divide. The second thing they found interactive learning, and this is key, it's the use of technology to explore, to design, and to create. And when, the, when tech's being used for that, that's worth every penny. You know what's not is what I'd probably say, in my opinion, is the most prevalent practice in our country when it comes to tech, and that's the digital drill and kill. The digital drill and kill, where we take the, let's say, the old worksheet, so to say, it's now scanned as a PDF online, and we're just doing like kind of problem after problem after problem. Everybody's doing the exact same thing. That's not showing any impact. You know, I, I was with them today. They sponsored our summer today. They do amazing stuff, amazing work. They had awesome releases today to help personalize a little bit more. This is not a knock on them. I want to be clear on that. But something like Google Drive, it's an amazing tool. It's awesome. However, if I use Google Drive, it's very simple. Google Drive could simply be an electronic version of the packet of papers in the folder that used to be in the desk is now sitting on my Chromebook with no pedagogical difference. Now, again, that's not a knock on Drive, and it doesn't have to be used by that. But just because we're now using Google and it's now in Drive and it's now electronic, sometimes we're patting ourselves on the back like, wow, we're doing all this amazing learning. Well, no, it's just now on a computer and it's not in your, your desk. If that's all we're changing, we're spending a lot of money and not getting anything for it. Again, hear me clear, not a knock on Google. They're awesome. Driving that stuff can be great. Lots of good collaboration tools and those kinds of things. How do we get to explore, design, and create, not just the digital drill and kill? The other piece to that is the right blend of teachers and technology. I encourage you to take a look at that, that study. It's only seven or eight pages of synopsis of it, but it also gets to start to highlight some of the things. What are we doing? Common practices that honestly are a waste of money. Like we're spending all this time and it's just not doing it. Next slide. So explore, design, and create are really key. Keep going, Mitch. So I mentioned that. Keep going, that digital use divide piece. So 
I, if we had more time, if we had more than 17 minutes, I, I would ask you to wrestle with this. And I started to pose it, but I, I do want you to ponder it after tonight. You walk through your schools tomorrow, maybe your classroom teacher, you know, what does that successful infusion look like? Just because we're all using tech or it goes really well doesn't actually mean it's high levels of learning. If you use that Webb's depth of knowledge or Bloom's taxonomy, how do we still get to those higher ends? Not just now, again, it's not inherently bad just because I'm logging on a computer to watch a video. We don't want to look at it and say, oh, that's a bad use of technology. No, it's just that's going to be a low level use of technology. So how do we get to those higher ends? Next one there, Mitch. Let me hit this one quickly as well. This is personalized professional learning, and I'll try and sum it up in just a, in just a couple moments. My very first book was on this topic, and I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this notion of professional learning, partially because we spend billions of dollars a year in this area. And we've got to ask ourselves, with billions of dollars a year being spent, how much actually changes? So it's another area that Eric and I really, really dove into and look. And look <clears throat> when you look at personalized professional learning, when you look at this area, kind of the one way I'll put it, the one statement is, the top down one size fits all sit and get hours based accountability which i will say is prevalent has been prevalent it's really shifted a lot in the past five or six years but has been 10 years ago that was the norm 99.9 percent .9 of schools you find any research out there on that shows it really doesn't show any it doesn't really make any impact like we're all horrified because that's all what we've always done but show research out there that shows other than that you have to see what does work. How do we make learning more personal? Next slide there, Mitch. So some of the elements you can see there, that shared ownership, shared responsibility, that 21st century skill set, that more personalized approach. What does that even look like? And also that broad-based participative evaluation. Those are, again, the elements from Future Ready that are research-based. And go ahead, Mitch, next slide. I'm going to keep rolling here, keep going. How do we make that if we have more time? How do we make it more personalized? We could get into what, it, how do we personalize? How do you take ownership of your own learning? Ultimately, from a school end, how do we get teachers to take ownership of their own learning? You guys all obviously do, because it's 8.45 on a Thursday night or when, whatever night today, Wednesday night, and we're all having this conversation when we could all be sleeping, right? And so how do we make that the normal mindset? Um, we, I wish we had a lot of time. We could dive into things like PLCs and things that research actually shows actually works. How do you empower people? The other thing is, you know, having been a longtime district administrator, I know what it's like to be the person that's always up front, always doing the training. How do we get our teachers to empower, how do we empower our teachers so they're sharing their genius on, on a daily basis, weekly basis? So much of professional learning to me is also cultural, that cultural mindset. For our admin here, and also part of it when we work with admin is, is how do you model that? You see, like from an administrative man, this isn't just what everybody else has to do. This isn't what you just have to lead. This is about you. Like, how do you grow professionally? How do you grow on a daily basis? How do you model that for your staff? For our admin that might be here, how do you run faculty meetings? How do you run in-service days? You know, are they a direct reflection for what you're asking teachers to do in the classroom? If they're not, I gotta be honest, that's hypocritical. If we're gonna ask our teachers to do it in the classroom with kids, we need to be doing those things with our teachers, whatever it may be. The next gear here, let me hit this one quickly. This is budget and resources. Uh, Mitch, let's go, let's go through this quickly. This in one word is sustainability. We could spend a lot of time on that. If we're buying stuff, we're buying iPads, Chromebooks, three, four, five years from now, when we have to replace those, where's the money come from? If we can't answer that, then we're gonna be in a really bad spot. And so how do we get that sustainability piece is really key. Next slide there, Mitch. Keep going. Next one, community partnerships, this next gear of the framework. How do you partner with your community? You know, when I was an elementary principal, I think I did a really good job working with parents, communicating with parents. I think it did a good job partnering with my businesses. The things that I could have done, you see most of our business, every single business, fathom this for a minute, every single business in the United States falls in the districts of a school district, falls in the boundary of a school district. How do we partner with them? How do we, con how do we connect with businesses? Now, sure, a lot of businesses might not be remotely interested but guess what so many times especially of our small businesses small businesses the backbone of our country where do those owners kids go to school quite often it's in our own district how do we partner with businesses what can we do when we see things like community wi-fi happening in places like that next slide minutes let's talk about partner community partnerships here for a minute you can see some of the um the different elements that are there next slide mitch I created this when I was a tech director, actually, and this talks about the communication side. And don't misunderstand it when you read it and hopefully get a little bit of a chuckle. You know, I can't wait to go home and check the school district webpage, said no parent ever. 
you know, I'm a parent. My daughter's in school. I got to be honest. I don't think I checked the, the school district webpage in doing what I do in probably a month. Now, that is not a knock against district web pages. Let me say this. It's 2017. It's our job to have robust websites because what business do we work with that doesn't have a robust website? It's really just an expectation. It's just an expectation, but let's not fool ourselves. Let's not think that our parents are driving home. We talk about community engagement. Let's not think that our parents are driving home being like, I can't wait to check the district website to see if they uploaded a new form today. Like nobody's doing that. So how do we do this? Let's go through these quickly here, Mitch. How do we start to, when we talk about it, I mentioned my good friend, George Kuros and what, what he does. I love how he talks about this notion that, you know, we need to make the positives so loud that the negative becomes hard to hear. You know, every one of our, every day in every one of our schools, amazing things happen. Every day. Yet when I pick up the newspaper and when I look online and I look on the news, I'm not typically seeing the awesome things that are happening in your schools every day, right? We see the negative. We see the news. We see, we constantly all get attacked. Do we not? But we know today with 250 school administrators, 45 minutes to share, amazing things in all the schools that are going on. How do we partner with our community? How do we share our story, tell our story in all the great ways and all the great things we're doing? Next slide, Mitch. Let me hit one other piece here. That's a, that's a, uh, we're gonna go through this quickly, Mitch, but that's a, a map of Mount, Mount Everest. That's actually the Wi-Fi map. I want you to look, at, if you can see quickly, the, see the statistic in the bottom left? I've worked with the FCC and, and the people there related to E-rate and lifeline modernization. When you look at those things, do you realize that 5 million of our nation's children, when they leave us at school, 5 million of them, go home to no internet access or no connectivity. Next slide. You want to talk about partnering with the community? Let me give you a couple quick examples. So that's Russell Booker. He was the superintendent of the year uh, last year, I believe, in South Carolina. You know what they started to do? Talk about partnering with the community. They created, and they were doing this digital initiative. They re Russell and his team reached out to all the businesses in his community. And what those businesses said was, uh, they said to the businesses, hey, this is what we're doing. But inside our community, many of these kids do not have Wi-Fi at home. As a business, and they started with Starbucks, McDonald's, public library, places that already do it, already have it. Would you be willing to let our kids come after school that don't have connectivity at home? Would you let them hop on? And they created the map that you can see there quickly that they then share with kids. Hey, if you go home and you don't have access, here's all the places in our community that you can go hop online totally for free and you're welcome to work. Russell, I talked to him a couple months ago. You know what he said? He said there was a business that, that called him up and said, you know, we like when a couple are coming here. This is really pretty cool. And these are our kids, our families, our community. We had a really good year this last year as a business. As a district, is there anything else we can help you with? What, what can we get for you? What do you need? That's partnering with the community. That's partnering. Also, if I'm, if I'm one of those families, how, how does that make me feel? That's building a relationship. You're showing them that matters. And by the way, that didn't really cost Russell and his team anything but time and relationship building. Next slide. Couple other quick examples. This is Kent School District in Washington. They create these Wi-Fi kiosks, and where are they putting them? In churches, in synagogues, in mosques, in laundromats, broadcasting Wi-Fi from the district, and all these basically huge hotspots throughout the community, so kids and families can go and they can work. They actually share with families and say, you know what? If you're a parent and you want to apply for a job and you want to hop on our Wi-Fi to do that, we encourage you to do that. In relationships. Next slide. So this notion of storytelling and branding, if we had more time, I'd, I'd, I'd again, get us together and be able to, to talk about this. How are you telling your story? How are you leveraging social media? How are you communicating? How do you communicate with those that don't have internet access? Sometimes we put it online and magic number being an elementary principal and saying to my secretary, you know, I sent it home one time, I put it on the website, how come nobody knows? And Shame on me for just thinking that everybody was magically going to be attracted to that. How do you leverage digital tools? We've got to meet parents where they are. Next slide. <clears throat> Couple more. We've got to go real quick here because of time. Let me mention this one quickly. Data and privacy. I had the opportunity to testify in front of Congress about two years ago on the privacy issue. If data and privacy is not on your radar, it needs to be. Next slide. Let me show you why. I think I've got this in here. Uh, let's keep going, Mitch. Next slide. <clears throat> So take a look at that. That was last year. 28 laws related to privacy were enacted, 188 bills in 47 states related to student data privacy. If you don't think this is on the radar federally, we work with Republicans and Democrats in DC. That's federal now. And I'm telling you on both sides of the aisle, 
is an issue. This this all. Do we expend FERPA? Do we open up FERPA? Does your average teacher have an idea of what their obligations are under FERPA, under SIPA, under COPA, under PPRA? Legally, but it's our responsibility. But do they know? And so, how do we make sure? How do we work with our staff? How do we train our staff? Most importantly, though, how do we keep kids safe? So how do we balance the, let's get them the great tools that they need, the great digital tools, yet we need to make sure we are protecting every single aspect we can, and also teaching kids about their digital footprint and digital citizenship. Next slide, Mitch. I'm going to keep going there just from a time standpoint. Keep going, keep going just from a time. Keep going. Let's hit the next one, robust infrastructure. Let me talk about this for just a couple moments. Um, access. Do we in our schools have that? E-rates helped a lot. We um, support. We helped support that with the FCC and helped to bring that out. How do we have that ubiquitous access? What What does that look like? The connectivity, things like refresh rates, refresh plans. The amount of times I'll talk to an administrator and, oh yeah, we're one to one. This is awesome. And I talk to the teacher and they're like, yeah, but my one to one cart are nine year old computers that take 27 minutes to boot. Well, that's like that refresh side of things. We need to make sure that it's it's uh, the ubiquitous connectivity is really there. Jump to the last, the next gear, Mitch. This is the use of space and the use of time. And so go ahead to the next one. When we take a look at say the use of uh, the use of space and the use of time, I really believe we're teaching what's called what I coined the the net. I'm sorry, not coined. What I call the Netflix generation of kids. You know, my daughter at six years old really has no concept of what it's like to have to wait until next Tuesday at seven o'clock to watch your favorite TV show. What do our kids today that are growing up, those with access, what, what are they doing? They get their content on demand when they want it, right then and there. That's the world my three-year-old lives every day. Those kids are coming through our schools. This wave is coming through our schools, a wave of kids that are used to content on demand. Well, that puts us in a really interesting spot, does it not? So how do we do this anytime, anywhere learning? What, who are you partnering with for high quality content that kids can get on a Saturday, on a July 12th? What, what does that look like? Where can they get that? Go ahead, Mitch. Next slide, Mitch. There's some of the elements you can see related to that. So I took two images. Think about the space side. So that's kind of learning anytime, anywhere side of it. But then there's the space. And there's been a really growing interest in this area in the past couple of years. Walk into the high school in whatever district you're in. I'm going to pick on high school for a minute. Walk into the average classroom, the average high school, and the average part of America, whatever that even might be. Probably made no sense, and I apologize about that. But you know what I'm saying. Like the average high school in our country. Picture a high school classroom. You have an image in your head. And it probably looks like somewhat like the screen you're looking at. If we're going to shift pedagogy, we've got to shift the space that it takes in. Think about this. How can we in good faith say that we're problem solving, we're collaborating, we all these 21st century skills, by the way, we're 17 years into that, just throwing that out there, all these skills, yet when we walk into the average classroom in many places, it's still teacher up front, kids are all islands unto themselves, I like to coin that kind of that cemetery effect piece. If we're going to shift the pedagogy, we've got to shift the space. There's a lot of research out there on learning space design. Eric and I actually outline it in the book um, that we're, we're doing for ASCD and um, and taking a look at like all the different things that impact the brain and impact how people learn. Learning spaces impact learning. Shifting pedagogy, shifting spaces. So how does this become a reality? Go ahead, Mitch. I know we're coming down on time here. So that's the framework. And I know I'm talking as quick as I can and trying to get us to interact a little bit, but Flying through there, th those are just snapshots of the different areas of the framework. Snapshots of the area. Now, I'll tell you, I didn't tell you anything new. Like these are all areas that you're aware of or something out there, but they're all research-based, essentially big bucket that we as districts have to work on. But what you'll notice around the outside is collaborative leadership. You see, in schools, without dynamic leadership, without a, 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 a school culture that's that um, is empowering or engaging or innovative, like this stuff doesn't happen. Let me flip it this way. In a toxic school environment, you're not going to get innovative things happening. It's not going to happen. Teachers need that ability to take risks. Teachers need that ability to try something that doesn't go as well. They try it a little bit differently. Go ahead, Mitch. Next, next slide. 
Let me share a couple of resources as we start to wind down here, and I certainly want to be respectful of everybody's time. So the Future Ready Dashboard is the resource that you're looking at there, dashboard.futureadyschools.org. It is linked off of the two resources that I shared earlier. Next slide. This is a tool that we created. It is research-based. Districts own their own data. Go ahead. It, lots of information about the framework. We have in there over 500 free resources. Mitch, next slide. Over 500 free resources from, if you take a look, some examples there, all of your organizations. It's the alphabet suit. AASA, NASP, NASSP, ISTE. We pull all those resources together, all the free runs, the free ones that tie from the future framework, and we put them in there for you for free. And so when you look at the different areas, dashboard.futureadyschools.org, look at the resources, you'll see featured resources. That's a quick screenshot of it. But if you scroll underneath, you'll actually then see some additional resources where you can sort, show me case studies, show me research, show me online tools, show me webinars, that kind of stuff. All totally free to help support you in this work. Next slide. Sorry, guys, really losing my voice. We also have a five-step process to help districts go through the Future Ready dashboard. Over winter break, I actually created um, video tutorials through YouTube, a YouTube playlist, to walk districts through step by step by step how to do this, from forming a leadership team in their district to taking an assessment that I'll share in just a moment, to then how do we get some other stakeholder input, and how do we create a plan for transformation. Next slide. So taking a look, that's a, just a quick example of the district assessment that's there. That's a screenshot of it. By the way, there's been a thousand school district teams, roughly nationwide, that have used what I'm talking about, a thousand different district teams. So this isn't some like fly by night type of thing that's gone tomorrow. Thousand district teams. Go ahead, Mitch. You can see in there, you get a variety of scores for all the different framework areas. So each of the different gear areas gets a set of scores. Each of the different elements also gets a set of scores. Go ahead, next slide, Mitch. Those are some of the different examples for elements. It helps districts keep going. It gets very, very specific, and it's hard to show you in a quick webinar and quick screenshots like this. But as you drill down, see, for instance, what you're seeing is a screenshot there of every single element area, every single, every gear area, every element area, then actually has specific gaps and strategies customized from your district. What we did is we worked with about 40 practitioners nationwide that for a few months, gaps that this district saw, what are the strategies you would do as a superintendent, as a tech director, what are the strategies that you would use to close those gaps? So districts get scores, gaps, strategies, all for free, all customized totally for them, no cost, and they own their own data. Check out the privacy policy. It's really important. Districts own their own data with all of this as well. You can see that. You can also get other stakeholder input. And when you look at the stakeholder input, you know, we can survey our teachers, we can survey our admin, those kinds of things to get other user feedback. Go ahead, Mitch. Next slide, Mitch. Go ahead, keep going. The other piece to that I encourage you to check out on futureready.org is our leadership hub, ongoing webinars and ongoing all totally free for district leaders to keep them connected, to get to showcase districts, the great work districts are doing. Here's the bottom line with all of that. Number one, just to sum it up, Future Ready is totally free. There's no sales pitch with it at all. Number two, <clears throat> the resources and the tools can help and support your district moving forward um, from implementation. Number three, our coalition partners that you've all heard of all across the board, their tools, their resources, under one spot, under one umbrella to help you move forward with this. I will tell you that we are going to launch phase three of Future Ready in the next couple of weeks. We will be doing a lot more locations in 2017. Can also give you a sneak peek. We're also going to have a strand. Um, we launched our strand for librarians um, back at ISTE this past year. There's a Facebook group that in the past week and a half, I've had almost a thousand librarians join. We're almost up to 2,000 in the first couple of weeks of people that are community communicating and connecting. We're going to be launching a Future Ready principal strand and we're going to have uh, content and strands for principals. Um, one, that one of them is more tech oriented, one that's more for instructional coaches or lead teachers, and then one for superintendents, assistant superintendents, kind of high level admin. That's all coming this year. In the next few weeks, you'll be seeing some things put out on that. Keep checking back at the website. I do want to give a shout out to FETC. I know for me personally, I'll be at FETC, McCall, ICE, Q, TCEA, um, MECA, NETA, um, where we also at a lot of these places, whether it's myself, 
other people are doing a variety of strands. And so at FETC in particular, we have a full strand of Future Ready sessions. We encourage you to check them out around these different gear areas. It's not all about Future Ready. It's all about different gear areas, what districts are doing to really implement that. I encourage you to check out those two areas. There's my personal contact stuff online. I apologize for going a few minutes over and starting to lose my voice at the end. And um, I hope that was helpful. But again, there's no sales pitch. There's really nothing here that's left to lose at all so, so, so thanks for investing the time feel? thanks for being here late at night so how does it feel to know that you've affected a thousand districts and all the kids that are associated with those districts so i, I would, so my first thing would say it's not me it's not about me i i am very blessed to help head up some of this but the impact and the in, uh, effect is that's from organizations across the board that's thousands of people working to culminate that work that's from even the president kicking it off himself to thousands of districts nationwide doing incredible, incredible stuff, working their tails off every day for kids. Those are the people that really should feel thanked. We're moving the needle. Hey, to help create something like this, sure, it, it I enjoy it. I, I feel like that, that's my way. You know what, Mitch, for me, it, it's hard for me to not be at a school anymore. It's hard for me to not walk down to my kindergarten class and hang out with five-year-olds. So for my personal satisfaction, I get to feel like I'm impacting other districts districts, other places, other areas by supporting them. But I miss being with five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, yeah. you know, and doing that. So sure, it's a great feeling, but I, I certainly don't want to take any credit personally. Credit goes to the, the thousands of people nationwide that have made all the, all the things across the board possible. And I don't say that lightly. I mean that. Well, good. Well, I hope you uh, continue to have a, a, a huge impact in 2017. And I'll see you down in Florida in a couple weeks. All right. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for investing the time. Hopefully that was helpful and you got something out of it. So thank you, Mitch. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. And thank you uh, from me. Uh, this is Mitch Berg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive and hope to see a number of you tomorrow night and uh, down on FATC in about a week and a half. Uh, take care.